Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This video is about proving the following identity. On each side, we have a finite sum that involves a binomial coefficient. N is a positive integer. Alpha is a nearly number. Each one of those sums can be written in terms of the hypergeometric function. But then to show the equality, we will have to manipulate the hypergeometric functions. In this video, we will not use the hypergeometric functions at all. We will try to show this identity using probability. Specifically, we will define random variable z in a specific way, as we will see shortly. We will compute the probability that random variable z is less than or equal to zero. We will do this computation of this probability in two ways. One way will yield the left-hand side, and the other will yield the right-hand side. Since we are computing the probability of the exact same event, then we have equality. What is the random variable that we will work with? Random variable set is equal to 2 alpha, where alpha will be taken initially as a positive real number. And then we have x Hermitian x. That's the L2 norm squared of vector x plus x Hermitian y plus y Hermitian x. What are the vectors x and y? These are n-dimensional vectors in the n-dimensional complex space. They are random vectors that are independent and identically distributed. Specifically, x and y, each one of them is circularly symmetric, complex valued Gaussian. The mean vector is the O0 vector in the n-dimensional space, and the covariance matrix is identity. This means that each component in X or Y is zero mean and has a variance of unity. Moreover, the components of vector X are independent of each other, the components of vector Y are independent of each other, and any random variable in X is independent of any random variable in the random vector Y. We compute the probability of this event, employing two methods. The first one is to look at the random variable z. If we condition on the random vector x, so x is treated as a constant vector, in this case, z is an affine transformation of the Gaussian vector y. This means that given x, z is Gaussian. In fact, it is real valued Gaussian because alpha is a real number, x Hermitian x is real valued. This quantity is complex valued, but it is added to its complex conjugate. So the first method, starts by computing not this probability, but the probability that z is less than or equal to zero given the random vector x. This probability is relatively easy to obtain because given x, z is Gaussian, real valued Gaussian. And because it's a real valued Gaussian, we need to obtain its two parameters, the first moment, the mean, and the variance. Given x, what is the expected value of z? Well, the first term to alpha x Hermitian x is now a constant. X is treated as a constant, so the expectation of x Hermitian y is x Hermitian the expectation of y given x, and y and x are independent. That's just the expectation of y. And the other term is the expectation of y Hermitian times x. y is an all zero vector, so these guys are equal to zero. The expectation of z given x is 2 alpha x Hermitian x. What about the variance? The variance given x, the constant term, will disappear when we compute the variance. So what is the variance of this sum here? This sum can be written explicitly as summation k from one to n, that's a summation over the components of vectors x and y, x Hermitian y, that's summation k from one to n, x k conjugate y k, y Hermitian x is summation k from one to n, x k y k conjugate. We have this summation and the terms are independent because of our assumptions regarding vectors x and y. The variance of the sum in our case here is the sum of variances. We just need to take the variance of the quantity, which is xk conjugate yk plus xk yk conjugate. And then we need to sum. And of course, this variance is given x. So we treat those guys as constants. What is yk in distribution? yk is circularly symmetric, zero mean unit variance Gaussian, like this. The variance of yk is equal to one. But here we have yk times xk conjugate, and we have yk conjugate times xk. So we have a rule that if we have a complex valued random variable u, which is proper, we say this as a general term, in our case, we say circularly symmetric, and if we have two complex constants, a and b, then the variance of a u plus b u conjugate, this is the variance of u times between brackets, the magnitude of a squared plus the magnitude of b squared. Let's prove this real quick. So for simplicity, assume that u is zero mean, the variance is the expectation of a u plus b u conjugate, times the complex conjugate, a conjugate, u conjugate, plus p conjugate, u. Now we have four terms. We have the magnitude of a squared, a is a constant, and then we have the expectation of u times u conjugate. That's the variance of u. 
And if we take these two terms, we will get the magnitude of d squared. And then we have, again, the variance of u. The two remaining terms are a, b conjugate to the expectation of u squared. And we have b, a conjugate, the expectation of u conjugate squared. If u is a proper random variable, if it's Gaussian, we say circularly symmetric, then by definition, this is equal to zero. And this is equal to zero. That's by definition. These two terms disappear. And we end up with this result here. Let's go back to our problem. We are conditioning on vector x. Those guys are treated as constants. And so according to our rule, this variance is the variance of yk, and that's unity, times the magnitude of xk squared plus the magnitude of xk conjugate squared. And of course, the magnitude of the conjugate is the same as the magnitude of the complex quantity itself. So the variance is 2 times the magnitude of xk squared times 1, which is the variance of u. And then we have the summation. When we sum, we are basically summing the magnitude of xk squared, k from 1 to n. That's exactly the L2 norm squared of vector x, which can be written in this way or as x Hermitian x. Now we know the conditional statistics of z given x. z is real valued Gaussian. This is the mean and this is the variance. We can compute the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 given x, and we can express this probability using the q function. Now we know that z is Gaussian. This is the mean value to alpha x Hermitian x, and we are interested in knowing this area here, which represents the probability that z is less than or equal to zero. This is the q function, and then we have the mean minus this threshold, so 2 alpha x Hermitian x, and then we divide by the standard deviation, that's the square root of the variance 2 x Hermitian x. This is the probability given x. Now, our interest is not the conditional probability. Our interest is the probability that z is less than or equal to zero then what we need to do is to take this Q function, multiply by the PDF of X Hermitian X, and then integrate. By doing this, we obtain our desired probability. What is the distribution or the PDF of X Hermitian X? The L norm squared of X is the real part of X1 squared plus the imaginary part of X1 squared plus the real part of X2 squared plus the imaginary part of X2 squared all the way to the real part of Xn squared plus the imaginary part of Xn squared. We have now the squares of 2n real valued zero mean Gaussian random values. Because each component in vector x has a variance of one and x is circularly symmetric, then the real and imaginary parts of each random variable in x are independent and they have the same variance. So the real part has a variance of one half and the imaginary part has a variance of one half. The L2 norm squared of vector x is the sum of the squares of 2n real valued Gaussian random variables that are zero mean and each has a variance equal to one half. If the variance is equal to one for each one of those guys, then we have exactly a chi square distribution with 2n degrees of freedom. Because the variance of each guy here is equal to one half, then the L2 norm squared of vector x is the distribution of a chi squared random variable with 2n degrees of freedom multiplied by one half. We can take the PDF of the chi-square distribution from any reference, and then we obtain the distribution of one half of a chi-square distribution with two n degrees of freedom. The PDF is exactly given by this expression here. If we call this s, f of s is s to the n minus one, e to the minus s divided by n minus one factorial, and of course, s is a non-negative random value. The conditional probability that z is less than or equal to zero in terms of s is the q function of square root two alpha squared s. We need to take this conditional probability, multiply by the PDF of S, the L2 norm squared of vector X, and then do the integration. If we do this, we are done. We have an expression for the unconditional probability that the random variable Z is less than or equal to zero. So the last step in this part using the first method is to evaluate this integral. But we will do first another integral, which is easier. This integration has the Q function, has S to the N minus one, and has the exponential. Now, I will do the integral with the Q function and just the exponential. We will add this parameter, which is beta. Integral 0 to infinity Q of the square root of 2 alpha squared. And then I will call my dummy variable of integration S bar, e to the minus beta S bar d S bar. If we do the change, S is equal to beta S bar, then this is the integral that we have. The Q function is written as an integral. We know that Q of zeta is 1 over square root 2 pi, integral from zeta to infinity e to the minus v squared over 2 dv. The integrand is real valued and non-negative. So by Tonelli, we can do the integration in any order of our choice. In this integral here, we fix S and then do the integration with respect to V first. 
what we will do is to integrate first with respect to s given v. So if we fix v, s goes from zero all the way to this curve. This curve is v is equal to the square root of two alpha squared s over beta. So s is v squared over two alpha squared over beta. Beta again is this parameter that is introduced here. We don't have it in our integration of interest, but it will be our method to obtain this integration with this term s to the n minus one. If we integrate first with respect to s, that's a relatively easy integral because the exponential is e to the minus s. The result is one minus e to the minus, and then we put the upper limit of integration, which is v squared over two alpha squared over beta. Now we have two integrals. And the first integration is one over beta. And then we have one over square root two pi, integration from zero to infinity, e to the minus v squared over two dv. This integral here is exactly the probability that a standard Gaussian random variable is greater than zero. That's one half. So if we take this term and integrate, we get one over two beta. What about the other term? In the other term, we have integral from zero to infinity. Outside, we have one over square root two pi. We have e to the minus v squared over two. And then we have one plus one over alpha squared divided by beta dv. Here, it looks like we are integrating a Gaussian with a variance that is the reciprocal of this quantity. So the result of this integration will be the square root of that variance times one half because we are integrating from zero to infinity and not from minus infinity to infinity. The result of this integration, g of beta is one over two beta, and then we have one minus the square root of the reciprocal of this quantity here. Now, how can we obtain our desired integral using g of beta? Well, if we differentiate once with respect to beta, then the variable of integration will come here and we will get minus s bar e to the minus beta s bar. If we differentiate another time with respect to beta, we will get s bar squared e to the minus beta s bar and so on. In other words, we can get our desired integral via differentiating g of beta n minus one times. And then after doing the differentiation, we set beta equal to one. The question now becomes, what is the n minus one derivative of this function of beta? We can think of this as the product of two functions, one over beta, and then one minus this bracket to the minus one half. Let's focus first on one over beta. If we differentiate once, we get minus beta to the minus two. If we differentiate another time, it's two beta to the minus three and so on. You can see the better, and this can be established rigorously by induction. The kth derivative of beta to the minus one, and if k is equal to zero, we mean the function itself. The kth derivative is minus one to the power k times the factorial of k times beta to the minus k minus one. What about the second function? The second function, if we differentiate once with respect to beta, this one disappears. We get minus one half times minus one, that's one half. We will get one over alpha squared, and then the bracket is raised to the power minus three over two. If we differentiate with respect to beta again, we will get minus three over two times one half, and we will get an extra one over alpha squared. The outside factor becomes one over alpha to the power four, and this power becomes minus five over two. If we differentiate again, we get five over two times three over two times one over two, then one over alpha to the power six, and the power becomes minus seven over two. So the case derivative, again, with the understanding that if k is equal to zero, we are talking about the function itself. The function itself contains one, and this one disappears in all the derivatives. So I will put here discrete delta of k. This is one if k is equal to zero and zero if k is strictly positive. Then we can write down the derivatives when k is one or two or three and so on as minus minus one power k. We have one plus beta over alpha squared and the power is minus k plus one half. We have one over alpha to the power two k. We have one over two to the power k. And then if we see this pattern, we have the double factorial of two k minus one. That's two k minus one times two k minus three times two k minus five and so forth. Let's rewrite this term. I will take those guys that are multiplied together and I will multiply numerator and denominator by two and four and six all the way to two K minus two and two K. We have multiplied by two to the power K times the factorial of K. Now in the numerator, we have a factorial, specifically two K factorial. This double factorial can be written as the factorial of two K divided by the factorial of K. And also in the denominator, we have two to the power K. This is the expression of the kth derivative. Now let's go back here. We are interested in this integral. We wrote down this integral and the idea is to differentiate it n minus one times and put beta equal to one. To differentiate n minus one times, we need to differentiate this n minus one times. If we have two functions of beta, g1 of beta, g2 of beta that are multiplied together, then what is the nth derivative? By Leibniz rule, the nth derivative is a summation. 
k from 0 to m if we are differentiating this product m times and then we have m choose k then we have g1 and with the superscript here i put a k this is the case derivative of g1 assuming that when k is equal to zero we are talking about g1 of beta itself and then we have g2 and here we put the derivative of order m minus k if we differentiate l minus one times then we have the summation i leibniz we do a sum the sum goes from zero to l minus one if we are differentiating l minus one times then we put here l minus one choose k and then we put the derivatives the kth derivative of one of the functions and the l minus one minus kth derivative of the other function the integral we are interested in replacing big l by small n is given by one half which comes from this term here and then we have this expression one of the sums we are interested in this quantity here is the probability that the random variable z is less than or equal to zero to show that this quantity is equal to the other sum we will go back to our random variable z and we will try to compute the probability of the same event but we need to employ another method in the second method we will obtain the bdf of z in the first method we conditioned on random variable x to exploit the fact that given x z is gaussian now we will go directly for the bdf of z and to obtain this pdf let's start by obtaining the characteristic function of random variable z random variable z can be written as the summation each term in the sum is independent of any other term by assumption and so the characteristic function of random variable z is the characteristic function of one of those terms raised to their number because they are independent and identically distributed what is the characteristic function of this quantity let's rewrite this as a quadratic form specifically i will write down this as a row vector with two components xk conjugate yk conjugate and then a column vector with two components xk and yk between them we have element one one is two alpha this positive number then one then one then zero if we multiply the matrix by the vector we get two alpha xk plus yk the second element will be xk now if we multiply from the left by this we get two alpha xk conjugate xk that's the magnitude of xk squared plus xk conjugate yk and finally we get yk conjugate times xk so this can be written in this form here the matrix that we have in this quadratic form is a hermitian matrix this matrix is diagonalizable and we can write down this matrix as a unitary matrix of two eigenvectors and then a diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues of this matrix and both eigenvalues are really valued because the matrix is hermitian we have lambda one and lambda two and then we have q hermitian that's the inverse of q because q is unitary then its inverse is its hermitian the next step is just to do eigen decomposition to this matrix what are the eigenvalues we take lambda times identity of size two by two minus this matrix now we compute the determinant in other words we obtain the characteristic equation equate to zero and we get that the eigenvalues of this matrix are alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared plus one the first eigenvalue lambda one let's take it to be the positive guy that's alpha plus the square root of alpha squared plus one the second eigenvalue lambda two that's alpha minus the square root of alpha squared plus one note that this square root of alpha squared plus one is greater than alpha the second eigenvalue is negative we will just keep them as lambda one lambda two or lambda one and the absolute value of lambda two and then at the final step we will remember those expressions and write down things in terms of alpha what is the benefit of this eigen decomposition when we do this eigen decomposition we get q hermitian times this vector here which is x k y k and we get the hermitian of this column vector x k and y k is a gaussian vector and what we are doing here is an affine transformation of this gaussian vector if this vector is a then what is the mean value of a the mean value of a is zero zero and what is the covariance matrix of a the covariance matrix of a so expectation of a a hermitian this is the expectation of q hermitian and then we have xk yk xk conjugate yk conjugate and then q q is deterministic we can take it outside the expectation so we have q hermitian and then we have the covariance matrix of this two-dimensional vector the elements of the vector are independent of one another and each one of them has unit variance this covariance matrix is identity of size two by two the covariance matrix of vector a is q hermitian q q is a unitary matrix so this is identity of size two by two in other words q hermitian times this vector is distributed it's equal in distribution to the vector itself a which is q hermitian times this vector 
is simply cn0 2 by 1 and then i2 by 2. The characteristic function is an expectation. It depends on the distribution. If we do eigen decomposition to this matrix here, q Hermitian times this vector and the vector itself both have the exact same distribution. So the characteristic function, which is an expectation, is the same if we just replace q Hermitian times this vector by the vector itself, because these two guys are identically distributed. This step here of eigen decomposing the matrix will allow us to simplify the quadratic form. Now, the quadratic form is just lambda 1 times the magnitude of xk squared plus lambda 2 times the magnitude of yk squared. Or we can write this as lambda 1, the magnitude of xk squared, minus the absolute value of lambda 2 times the magnitude of yk squared. Since xk and yk are independent, then the expectation can be split into a product of two expectations. Expectation of e to the i u lambda 1, then the magnitude of xk squared, times the expectation of e to the minus i u, the absolute value of lambda 2, magnitude yk squared. xk and yk are cn0 1, and so the magnitude squared is exponential 1 random variable. We can compute the characteristic function of an exponential 1 random variable or take it from a reference. Our conclusion will be that the characteristic function of this term here, when we compute the first expectation, we get 1 over 1 minus i u lambda 1. And when we compute the second expectation, we get 1 over 1 plus i u absolute value of lambda 2. The characteristic function of z is this product raised to the power n. We can think of the characteristic function of z as this characteristic function times this characteristic function, which means that z can be thought of as the sum of two independent random variables. One of them has this characteristic function and the other has this characteristic function. We can try to obtain the PDF of each one of those two random variables and then to obtain the PDF of the sum, which is z, we can do convolution. Generally speaking, eta over eta minus i u to the n is the characteristic function of the sum of n i i d exponential eta random values. So eta is a positive parameter. If we look at this characteristic function, we say, oh, this is the characteristic function of the sum of n exponential random variables. And each exponential random variable has the parameter 1 over lambda 1. I can take this and write it as 1 over lambda 1 divided by 1 over lambda 1 minus r u. This is, again, the sum of n i i d exponential random variables with the parameter 1 over lambda 1. What is the BDF of this sum? We can obtain the BDF of the sum of n i i d exponential eta random variables using a number of ways. Here, let's just do it by induction. We start by the BDF of the sum of two i i d exponential eta random variables. Uh, we take one uh, PDF and then we need to convolve it with another. So I will rewrite the PDF. If W is the dummy variable of integration, then in the second copy of the PDF, we replace W by W bar minus W. W bar will be the parameter of the output PDF. This indicator tells us that W is greater than or equal to zero. Not a surprise because the exponential random variable is non-negative. And then this other indicator tells us that W is less than or equal to W bar. We can remove the indicators and integrate from zero to W bar. Eta times eta will give us eta squared. Then when we multiply the exponentials, the term with w will disappear because here we have minus eta w, here we have minus eta w times minus w, and the remaining exponential is e to the minus eta w bar. Now there is nothing here that depends on w, so the integration is this term here times w bar. And of course, this is a non-negative random variable. We can do this again and again, and then we get a pattern, and this will be our guess for the PDF of n i i d exponential eta random variables. To finish off our induction proof, we will take this to be true and do one more convolution to make sure that this expression here is also valid if we increase n to n plus 1. So let's take this PDF, assumed to be the PDF of the sum of n i i d exponential eta random variables, and let's do convolution. Let's convolve with the PDF of one exponential eta random variable. Let's write down the missing indicator. These two indicators tell us that we can integrate from 0 to w bar. If we combine the exponentials, we get e to the minus eta w bar, and eta to the power n times eta, that's eta to the n plus 1. Now, those guys do not depend on the dummy variable of integration. We just need to integrate this one. So this will give us n times n minus 1 factorial, that's n factorial. And we get this above expression with n replaced by n plus 1. This is indeed the BDF of the sum of n i i d exponential eta random variables. Let's go back to our random variable z. The characteristic function of z can be written as the product of two characteristic functions. One of them is the characteristic function of the sum of n i i d exponential random variables with the parameter 1 over lambda 1. And then what about the other random variable? If this plus sign is a minus sign, then the other random variable will be the sum of n i i d exponential random variables with parameter 1 over the absolute value of lambda 2. What does it mean that the minus sign is a change to plus sign? It means that we are talking about a random variable which is the negative of the sum of n i i d exponential random variables with parameter 1 over the absolute value of lambda 2. 
the idea is simple. If we have random variable B, and then the characteristic function of B is by definition the expectation of E to the I U B. Now, what is the characteristic function of minus B? This will be expectation of E to the I U minus B. And we can think of this as the characteristic function of B, but now we can combine this minus sign with the U. We can replace the U here by minus U. So this plus sign means that this other random variable is the negative of a sum of exponential random variables. We will go to the PDF of the sum of n exponential random variables, and we will replace W bar by minus W bar like this. And the PDF of random variable Z is the convolution of these two PDFs. And I will choose W as the dummy variable of integration, take this PDF, copy and paste here. And now in the other PDF, we replace W bar we will make the output a function of Z. So we replace W bar by Z minus the dummy variable of integration. So this W bar here is replaced by Z minus W, and this W bar here is replaced by Z minus W. And finally, this W bar is replaced by Z minus W. We have two indicators. The first indicator is that W is greater than or equal to zero. The second indicator tells us that W is greater than or equal to Z. If Z is positive, we need now to integrate from Z to infinity. But our interest is in negative Z. Recall that the probability that we want to obtain is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to zero. So that's the integral of this PDF from minus infinity to zero. Our interest is in negative Z. One indicator tells us that W is greater than or equal to zero. The other indicator tells us that W is greater than or equal to Z, which is non-positive. So our integral will be from zero to infinity. If for some other reason we are interested in the case of positive Z, then we need to do the integration from Z to infinity. For our purposes now, our integration is from zero to infinity. To carry out the integration, we will write down the binomial expansion of W minus Z to the power N minus 1, which is given here. So summation, V from 0 to this power, which is N minus 1. We have N minus 1, choose V, and then we have this guy raised to the power V. And then we have this guy minus Z raised to the power N minus 1 minus V. We have a summation with a finite number of terms, and we can carry out the integration term by term. The terms that have the dummy variable of integration W are this exponential. Here it is and w to the n minus 1 times w to the power v. So here we get w to the power n minus 1 plus v. This integration looks very much like a gamma function. The way to go is simply to do change of variables. Let's call this w times 1 over lambda 1 plus 1 over the absolute value of lambda 2. Let's call this thing t. If we do this change, we end up with an integral that is from 0 to infinity t to the n plus v minus 1 e to the minus t dt. That's gamma of n plus v, which is n plus v minus 1 factorial. And when we do the change of variables, we will get this term here, 1 over this bracket, 1 over lambda 1 plus 1 over the absolute value of lambda 2 raised to the power n plus v. Before proceeding, note that we get from here this factorial. And then when we did the binomial expansion, we got factorial n minus 1 divided by the factorial of v. And also in the denominator, we have the factorial of n minus v minus 1. Note also that the PDFs that we have convolved, they have this n minus 1 factorial. We can combine those guys here, this factorial, together with this guy, together with n minus 1 factorial. This will give us the binomial coefficient n minus 1 plus v. Choose v. Then we have this guy, which is this one, and the other copy of n minus 1 factorial square will go with the numerator here. So this gang of factorials can be written as this binomial coefficient divided by the factorial of n minus 1 minus v. This is the PDF of random variable Z when small z here is less than or equal to zero. Just one more step, which is to get the probability that the random variable big Z is less than or equal to zero. We need to take this PDF and integrate it from minus infinity to zero. Where are the Zs in our expression? We have here in this exponential, and we have this one here. We take those terms, we integrate from minus infinity to zero. And as you can see again, we have something that can be made in the form of the integral of the gamma function. In our case here, we will do the substitution that t is equal to minus z divided by the absolute value of lambda 2. When we do this substitution, we get the integration from infinity to 0, and there will be a minus sign to get this integration back from 0 to infinity. We get this factorial n minus v minus 1, which is this guy here. In other words, from the factorials, we are just left with this binomial coefficient and with these terms. The last thing is to recall the expressions of lambda 1 and lambda 2 so that we can write down our summation here in terms of alpha. The first sum was 1 half minus 1 half, and then we have the square root of alpha squared over alpha squared plus 1. Summation, if we write also using the index v, v from 0 to n minus 1, 2v choose v, 1 over 4 to the power v, and then we have 1 over alpha squared plus 1 to the power v. 
these two sums, they look very different from one another, but they must be equal because both of them represent the same quantity. The probability that random variable Z is less than or equal to zero. We have now established this identity.